Hey guys, I'm Tim Hyde from Winmore Clients, a digital marketing strategist specialising in marketing automation technology and super excited to come up shortly with the online prosperity show with Prosper, where we're going to be talking all things marketing and automation and I can't wait for you to join us on the show. Looking forward to it. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And today, I've brought you the marketing automation specialist himself, Tim. Tim, how are you doing, my man? I'm doing very well, Prosper. Thanks for having me on the show today. Absolutely. And if you're watching this show right now, you would understand that we always bring you experts within their own realm. Um, people that are going to be helping you have a business that's actually profitable and enjoyable. And the reason why I've actually brought team um, across is because if you're going to be running a business, it has to be a profitable endeavor that actually runs without you. So all that laptop lifestyle, all that, um, you know, traveling and going places, it's not going to happen all and of its own if you don't have any sort of automation happening within your business. And if you want to create effective marketing and sales uh, machine within your business, it's a never ending cycle, which if you can automate some of the parts, it would actually make it easier and make you have um, a happier existence. Now, I could go on and on and on, but I'm not an automated being. I'm a human being, so I might as well let Tim, um, you know, go on uh, with his area of expertise. Now, Tim, thank you so much. Tell us a little bit about your story and how you um, got started uh, with Win More Clients. Yeah, man, absolutely. Um, look, I had my I had my first business when I was six, and believe it or not, it was not a lemonade stand. Uh, I had a circus, and I thought this was actually really cool, right? Um, and uh, had you know, my, my bag of money went down to the local shops and um, bought a hundred one cent lollies. Right? And this is back when you could buy one cent lollies and whether, you know, when a sandwich bag actually seemed like a lot of stuff because you had a much smaller hand to get into it. But it was so much that I was sort of, I don't know if I was either hooked on the sugar rush or this idea that I could convert money into really cool stuff uh, <laughs> as, a, as a six year old. So I really kind of had created this lifelong love affair with this thing called business. And also sort of, you know, I tried a bunch of stuff um, as a kid, everything from importing Ugg boots to making and selling wine racks, to door to door sales to, you know, my circus and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, but never really, I guess, never really kind of went into business in a kind of meaningful or proper way until I was an adult. An adult. And I just, um, I just got out of university. I'd gone into the public service, which is the thing that people in Canberra do, because right? I live in Canberra. Um, everyone goes in the public service, okay? Uh, and I found myself sitting there looking around over the course of the next 10 years with these golden handcuffs on going, I must be completely brain dead. This seems super inefficient. Right? Now, no one would ever accuse the government of being efficient, <laughs> except for someone who works in government, they would believe they are. And on the side of that, I'd built this business called the Riot Act, which is a community forum you know, pre-social media, um, what we now know as social media, uh, it around the sort of turn of the century, around early 2000 with a couple of mates. And we built this thing and I just turned it into this online, you know, online version of a newspaper where we were selling advertising. The thing that I found really interesting though, and that most of our clients were still struggling with this emerging, emerging digital marketing space, right? Um, you know, we didn't really understand Facebook advertising. We didn't really understand. I mean, Google was the kind of platform that people went to there and people still go to Google from an AdWords perspective, but we didn't have many other options to communicate. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have a LinkedIn. We didn't have Facebook groups. We didn't have all these other channels. Um, video was pretty much confined to television advertising. Um, but in, invariably what I found is that people didn't have a maturity of marketing process to convert attention into customers. Now, Prosper, you and I were talking off air just a second ago about that the fact that your business is not, is, its success is not defined by the customers you sign. Ironically, your, its success is defined by how many of the customers who don't do what you want them to do, come back and do what you want them to do. Right? So pushing people back in, to this idea we now call a funnel. Right? And now, 
I just happen to think that a funnel is just a fancy marketer way of saying customer life cycle, that's something that's, that's always happened. But we want to push people back into what we want them to do. Right? So that's where I sort of came up with this idea of win more clients. I left that business in 2013, uh, sort of sick of being sued um, over what other people said on my website. We're not protected by First Amendment rights here. <laughs> Second Amendment rights are free speech, I should say, uh, in Australia, which you know Facebook is protected by. But you know, had this sort of thing that you know I was consulting with with my clients at, at Riot Act about how do you convert attention into customers? How do you build an effective sales funnel that you know once you've got people that you turn them into fans and advocates that they continue to kind of feed the front of front of your your customer life cycle. So your business creates this sustainability. Um, and I just kept getting asked to do the same sorts of things by clients there. And, and that sort of led into this automation space today um, that I've worked with a lot of people on. You know, how do we create that? But how do we create that in a leveraged way? Absolutely. And thank you so much for your story right there. Because I like the last word that you put across that leverage. Um, tell us a little bit about what you actually help um, your clients with, um, especially how they can leverage their time and um, utilize um, the services that you are providing. Yeah, sure. So I work primarily in three areas. I work in uh, marketing strategy. Um, and I won't say digital marketing strategy. I think it's one of the same. Uh, once upon a time when I did IT at uni, IT meant everything, right? It was computers, everything to do with computers. And now, now we know that IT has so many different disciplines in it. Marketing is the same. There's no real separation between digital marketing and marketing now. We've just got different channels. Right? So one of the key areas I work on is getting people's marketing strategy right in the first place, really understanding who their customer is, how their customer buys, what that customer journey looks like as they go through their business. When, do they, when is that customer putting their hand up that they're ready to buy? What are the indicators that they're ready to buy that we can start a sales conversation? We know that if we start that sales conversation too soon, we run people away. And that's a mistake that so many businesses make in that we get an inquiry and we get straight on the phone and try and close, this, and try and close them. They're just not ready for it yet. Right? In the same way that if we were you and I, I know you were married, you know, young kid, same young kid out there, probably playing Fortnite instead of doing his homework. Um, but, you know, if I'd met my wife at the bar and I'd proposed to her on the first date, she would have run a mile. I would be married to someone else right now or might not be married at all if I kept doing that same strategy. It took time to build a relationship with her until such time as she said yes. And then I celebrated that with, you know, an engagement party and a wedding and a honeymoon. Right? We actually had a second honeymoon, which was kind of fun. And then I kept that relationship alive because I, you know, I sent a period of flowers. I remembered her birthdays and important dates to her. We renewed our vows on our 10th wedding anniversary and that kept the relationship going beyond. Now we don't tend to do that in our business. I mean, everyone watching this show right now can think of somebody, <laughs> and dare I say it happens a lot in trades, <laughs> <laughs> right, where someone's really pursued us, really wanted our business. They've marketed us really heavily. We see them everywhere. They sell us whatever products or services when we finally to come and say yes, and then all of a sudden there's crickets. crickets. There's nothing, right? And we're like, when it comes to buying that product or service again, they start the whole life cycle over, not keep, it, keep us top of mind so that we are ready to buy we choose one of the biggest buying motivations that there is in business to make our life easy. Right? We buy the same car because it makes our life easy. We buy the same phone when a new phone comes out right? because it makes our life easy to just choose the same phone. I don't want to have to go and replace all my apps on my iPhone, so I'm just going to buy another iPhone again. No matter how good Samsung has to be so much better. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But I have to go and replace all the apps. It's not worth the pain of me changing to another solution. Now, in business, we forget that. You know, that customers have this life cycle that continues to circle around and they keep buying from us. Except maybe coffins. Now that I think of it. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you so much for that, Tim. Right. Now, now, Tim, somebody might be sitting here and thinking, oh, you know, I'm a one-man band and my business is not big enough 
for me to actually invest heavily in some sort of marketing or automation. Um, would you, what would you say to, to somebody who's thinking in that sort of uh, paradigm? To be honest, I think there's no right time and there's no late time, right? I pretty much think that everyone's um, ready for it right now. Okay. One of the things that I know in business is that we generally leave working for an idiot right, to come and work for an even bigger idiot, being ourselves. Right? I mean, then try and do everything really hard. Um, and we t take on everything. And you know, certainly when we're starting out in business, uh, and this is a valuable lesson I learned years ago. I mean, I did IT at uni. I can code. I can read HTML. And it took me seven hours to put my first website together. And at the end of it, I'm like, this is ridiculous. I can't get this bloody thing to work. And I sent it off to my developer that I'd got through Upwork um, in the Ukraine. And he came back 32 minutes later with it all done. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Not long. Okay, have a guess. Have a guess what that cost me. Um, it, it would have costed, uh, I don't know, uh, 100 $200? No. Seven dollars and fifteen cents. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And this was this. This is this is this massive epiphany to me that we in business we spend so much time doing tasks that are in our incompetent zone, right? Stuff that we really don't enjoy doing and really don't know how to do very well, right? Or in our competent zone, things that we can do but really shouldn't do because they at the end of the day doing that we just argue with our significant other or shoot ourselves in the head because it's so terrible, right? You know, all those things, like I hate bookkeeping. I could, I can send invoices all day long, don't be wrong, but paying invoices, reconciling accounts, that would, if I had to do that all day long, that would drive me nuts. Absolutely. <laughs> now my genius zone is strategy. It's working on uh, CRM and automation for people. It's training, you know, in the digital marketing sphere, teaching people how to use the technology that they have available to them that they're possibly not aware of, how to make their life easy. That's my genius zone, right? Awesome. Working with my team to create further leverage, that's in my genius zone. For every hour that I spend in my genius zone, I'm not doing some of these other things that I can potentially outsource to someone else. I'm either gonna be eliminating them, automating them, or delegating them to somebody else at a, and getting a probably a much better result than I could. I could have so that seven hours I spent on my website I could have gone and signed potentially seven clients I could have talked to 15 referral partners in seven hours or 14 referral partners in seven hours right Absolutely. which would have driven my business so much further forward than spending that time trying to build a website that I really didn't know how to do Absolutely. Absolutely. I could have built I could have built automation to look at what was I was doing in my business and going this is a task that I do on a daily basis and it takes me five minutes to do this task. Right? And that five minutes might not seem like very much, but over the course of a year, two years, three years, four years, five years in your business, that one task can massively add up to the cost of what we should not be doing. And it's holding us back from growing our business. So to answer your question, when is the right time to invest in automation? Right now. Absolutely. Right Absolutely. You know, I find it astonishing that people would spend seven to ten thousand dollars on building a website to convert traffic and then not put a CRM system in place to manage the relationships that that thing creates for us. Great stuff. Great stuff. I'm still holding on to the fact that you were paying yourself a dollar an hour uh, trying to fix a website um, that you then ended up paying seven dollars uh, for yeah. somebody who fixed it up. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and when you say it like that, it actually seems completely crazy, isn't it? Why would we do that? Why would we be that idiot in our business to go, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a great idea. <laughs> you really can't right. climb the ladder of success with your hands, um, you know, full. Exactly. That's, no, that's absolutely, that's absolutely right. You know, and it creates this thing, right? We don't go into business to have another job working for that idiot. What we go into business, as you said, you know, earlier on, we go into business to create, you know, time, flexibility, freedom to do the things that we really want to do with our life. Now, to change our world. Now, that world might be just you and your family. Absolutely. Right? It might be, might be the world. Right? 
we might want to, you know, change the way things have done, like, you know, Zuckerberg or Bono or whoever else, right? or Fred <laughs> Hollows. Okay? Whatever our purpose is, we didn't go into business to be, to have a job. We went into business to create, create something that facilitates opportunity for us as business owners. Great stuff. Great stuff. Now, obviously you did raise a lot of points there, Tim, and thank you so much for, for the value you're dropping in this show right now. <laughs> so <laughs> feel free to rewind and watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. It's probably going to be one of our best episodes. You mentioned, um, a bias journey, which obviously a lot of people might not be aware of what that actually is within their business. You know, the start and the end up until the transaction happens. And you did mention there's a couple of touch points um, that would be happening. And obviously all of that uh, would need to be automated so that you're on top of um, everything else. Um, how effective is it um, you know, to, to, to automate your lead nurturing, um, especially uh, these days where people are across all platforms, across, um, you know, all social media, and you have to be, um, you know, making sure that you are there on every one of those touch points without annoying your audience. Yeah. Well, the, the, the buyer's journey, everyone has a buyer's journey um, for every single product they buy, right? If we're buying Tic Tacs, it's a really short thing. Right? If I'm buying a house, it's a much longer and more involved process because I've got to make more decisions. There's more risk involved and more consider factors to consider. But we try and sell when it, you know, we can't sell stuff when we want to sell stuff. We can only sell stuff when our customers are ready to buy from us. Right? So understanding where the collateral, where the tactical implementation of your marketing strategies fit in, you know, in that buying journey is really, really important. So for example, if you get most of your business via, um, you know, networking and referral, what you'll probably find is that your website is not the first place people hear about you, but it will be part of that buying journey. Okay, so imagine if you were to draw a line on a bit of paper right now, and at one end of the, that line, you've got someone who's um, has never heard of you, have no idea what it is you do, you know, may or may not even be a problem that they're aware they've got a problem. At the other end of the line is someone who's ready to buy from you. Okay, that's the dollar sale. Now, someone towards the end of that line, that customer or that prospect becomes ready to buy. They've made the mental leap in their mind that they're going to purchase from you. Now that's where your sales efforts should be focused as much as possible because that's the high converting time, right? If someone's, you know yourself, when you've spoken to clients at some point, you can recognize that look in their eyes that says they bought from me. If you're selling to a husband and a wife, one of them will turn to the other and pull their sleeve and go, we should do this, right? That's the point where they've decided they're going to buy but before the transaction, there's this mental switch. Before that, there's a bunch of steps that people go through. Sometimes, again, depending on the product, it might be really, really quick. Other times, they'll need social proof. They'll need to go through an education process. Uh, you'll need to provide value for them in, to start with. They'll need to see you in multiple channels. Right? They'll need to see enough of you often enough to go, you are the expert in this particular space. Now, whether that be, you know, through email marketing, whether that through SMS, whether that be ads on Facebook, whether that be you putting articles on LinkedIn or in the newspaper, whether that be hearing your ad on radio, right, or seeing you on a stage, people have to go through a journey of enough touch points and enough education for them to convert, right? Because here's what we know. If you were to draw a Again, just draw a pyramid on a bit of paper there for us. 3% of the audience that you reach at any particular time are ready to buy from you. They're not, they haven't bought from you. They're just ready to buy from you or somebody else, right? So your 50% close rate really only converts one and a half people. 30% of the people you bring into your world will never buy from you. In fact, some of those people, you don't want them to buy from you. So the other 60 or 7% of people who, who discover you could buy from you if you built enough, if you took the time to build a relationship. 
Great stuff. If, uh, if you can maintain a relationship with those people for two years, 85% of them will buy. Right. Right. Now, these are not my stats. These have come out of sort of all sorts of research they do in the US. Right? But that's, I mean, that's, that's, that seems kind of crazy that of all the people you meet that represent your ideal customer, 85% of them will buy from you. That would completely change every business in the world right now. But obviously, you know, some people, whoever we want to attract, are already buying from somebody else. So they need to know, like, and trust you in the process. And automation actually uh, saves the that's, day there. Okay. That's absolutely true. Okay? And this is where we create, use, you know, automation technology to create this leverage to allow us to have lots of conversations with people at different stages of the buying journey. So, you know, you're at a different stage to, to John, to Sally, to Tina whoever else, right? Everyone's at a different stage in that journey. And if we try and treat them all the same, it'd be like trying to talk to all of your friends in your world right now, or all of your family with the same message and getting them all together and say, all right, guys, this is what's happening right now. And then they'd all look at you strangely and you're like, what's wrong with you? What's, why, is, why are you looking at me strangely? <laughs> They'll come and take together. you. That's why I come together. They'll come and take you and strap you in with, with a straight jacket or some sort of... Absolutely. It'd be like saying, let's go out for McDonald's. And one of them's going, you know, I'm a vegetarian, right? <laughs> Great stuff. Now, Tim, obviously within uh, a business day, there's a myriad of uh, activities that are happening. And as you say, we now live in a, a global and always on sort of um, environment, which means we have to be speaking to uh, 400 people with the same voice, with different uh, sort of... Um, messages at the same time what sort of um uh, automations can you recommend uh for business people to look into to actually make sure um that they're leveraging their time more what 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 activities within their business uh can be automated uh, so i think you can you can automate just about any manual task right? um, or repetitive task particularly right if it's going to something that's going to be once requires um, significant manual handling or creativity that's not a task that I would do all right but so I wouldn't automate a phone call to a client but potentially I would automate the reminder to call a client right okay so that's that's an example in its very simple form things like um, uh, you know if someone comes in by your by your website to a contact form you know the automation might be send that customer a response or an auto, auto email from someone in your, that's, that's been allocated to in your sales team to say, thanks very much for getting in touch. Susan will be with you within 24 hours. Okay. And then a task is allocated to Susan to contact that, that prospect. That right? So that's a very simple automation. Right? So trigger event is the customer hitting your website or filling out the form. And then we've got two things that are done. One is an automated email response. And the other one is a task raised for one of the staff members to create a response. Okay. Other automations can be things like uh, copying information from um, your CRM system to your accounting platform if someone purchases a, purchases a product. Uh, some of the things I'm doing with clients at the moment right now is when they go in for a quote and they've delivered a quote to a customer, that we add that customer to a custom audience in Facebook and then advertise to people who are receiving quotes. Right. So another example of an automation. Right. Uh, I've got one that another one that um, raises a periodic task for me to reach out to my referral partners. Now it doesn't do the referral. It doesn't reach out to them on my behalf, but what it does do is raise that task to remind me that I need to nurture a relationship with those referral partners and stay top of mind if I want them to remember who I am. Right. Okay. And I've created a bunch of little shortcut notes that when I apply the note and record that I've had a conversation, it will trigger some sort of follow-up process. So those are very simple sort of examples. Um, what's another one? I've got one that automates a process that sends my wife flowers. <laughs> so periodically it sends an, you know, sends an order off to her favorite florist. And, and buys her flowers, which she thinks is super romantic and incredibly lazy at the same time. We, we sure hope she's not going to watch this segment of the show then. 
Oh, she's seen it. She saw me build it in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can do all sorts of things. Right? Um, a new staff onboarding process where someone might be added to a, you know, need to be added to, you know, various systems. We trigger an onboarding campaign. That's the trigger. We know we've got a new staff member inducting and they sent a bunch of training materials and nudged and reminded if they don't watch those training materials. If they do, fine. If they don't, maybe we trigger off a probation review process. Great, great. So we can do all kinds of, all, you know, some really interesting things with automation that doesn't necessarily have to be about talking to our customers and trying to nurture them to the point of sale, exactly. even though that's the obvious one, right? So automation has got, you know, a massive number of applications in our business to do all sorts of different things and give us back those, you know, that, that minute, that two minute, three minute, four minute, five minutes, half an hour a day. Um, you know, even a couple of hours a day that can create real leverage in the business and free us up to do whatever the hell we want to do. Absolutely. Now, Tim, somebody will be watching this right now and thinking that flower trick is actually uh, something I'm going to try and implement. Do you have any tools um, <laughs> that you can recommend um, that people can, you know, start using or the ones that you can help people to implement within their business? Look, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Infusionsoft. Um, I don't think there's any, any automation tool that can really do all things for all people. Um, get close is, is, is my recommendation. The other thing is don't start too complex. No one built the Taj Mahal before learning how to put bricks together. Um, and if you try and start too complex, you'll just trip yourself up. So start incrementally. Um, whether you want to use something like Active Campaign, even MailChimp, you could get away and jump into that. Um, I don't generally recommend um, small businesses go to an enterprise solution like Salesforce or um, Marketo. Again, it's not the system that will trip you up, right? It's you understanding what your customer journey is and what are the steps you go through to really understand what, what do you do in your business? Break it down to the very minutia and not just what a customer should do, what happens if they don't do the thing you want them to do. That's where, thing, that's where things break. And that's the kind of the probably complex bit um, about implementing any automation system. Absolutely. You don't understand the breakdown of the process that you're trying to automate, putting it into an automation system will possibly hasten your demise. Absolutely. Because you won't be able to see what's going on anymore. Because <laughs> <laughs> you need to know what you're automating in the first place. That's right. That's right. But there's all sorts of things. So I've got on my website, um, there's uh, eight tools that I use. Um, you know, digital tools that I use for, from an automation perspective, um, you can grab that at winmoreclients.com.au forward slash eight tools, number eight tools. Um, and that's a great one. The other one there's there is 25, uh, the 25 things that I think every small business should automate to get back, uh, you know, half an hour a day in their business. And that's got a bunch of ideas that you could say, oh, yep, yeah, I do that. That would save me some time um, right. and all money. Great stuff. Obviously, if you've got a toothache, you would go to a dentist. If you have a brain tumor, you'd go to a brain surgeon. So obviously, if people are watching this show right now and they're thinking, I really need to start leveraging my time and actually doing more with the time that I have, which is connecting uh, with the people that you can then demand money off of, I think... <laughs> it's wise to actually start implementing some automating automation strategies. Now, if somebody um, has been intrigued by, you know, what you do for work and how you can best help them, what's the best way that people can get a hold of you there, Tim? Look, jump in on my website, uh, winmoreclients.com.au. Grab, grab, uh, you can find me there. Um, or connect with me on, on Facebook or, or LinkedIn. You can find me on those two as well, pretty regularly. So any of those? Absolutely. Now, Tim, I mean, you would understand this. As an entrepreneur, we always want to make sure we're rolling our sleeves and we're going in um, in the dirt and not letting go of anything because if I do let go, then everybody's going to start thinking that I am cheating and I'm not actually <laughs> doing and fulfilling my tasks. What's your ultimate advice to somebody who just thinks uh, automation is for cheats? Uh, I would really rethink the way you do things. Uh, you're, you're making it hard on yourself just for the sake of making it hard. Right? Um, we were talking offline earlier 
um, about sort of what's happened to, to me and my family over the last couple of years as we were comparing notes. And my wife had a stroke just on three years ago now. Um, very unexpected. She was 36 at the time. Um, and she collapsed in their office at work and she was in hospital for 10 days. Uh, so immediately I was like, my business isn't important. You know, I've got a then an, an eight-year-old son to look after. Um, you know, I've got to, you know, I want to be in hospital with my wife. Um, and if I had, you know, and it took her look 12 months of recovery before she could even sort of walk and talk again properly um, and still suffers from time to time as well. But if I had not put some of these things in place in my business now, um, you know, or had it, I guess the traditional approach, give it to a staff member to kind of do the stuff that I was doing, there's no way that I would still have a business. I would have, I would have wound it up straight away. Right? And that would have put us under massive financial stress. Right? So, you know, when I look at it, like that and answer that question and say, you know, should you be doing these things? Absolutely. We cannot predict what's going to happen to us, right? We can sort of plan a path of what our growth is going to look like, but we can never unpredict, never predict those, those curve balls that life is going to throw at us, right? And it might not be, it might be a loved one. It might be you that can't do what you do anymore, right? So, you know, building a business that's resilient that's not necessarily, it might be not as reliant upon us to do the things we do that I can hand over and say, just follow the system. Right? Michael Gerber, I think, says it best. Right? A business is a thing where you build systems to run the business and the people run the systems. Absolutely. Right? And if you want your business to go where you want it to go, whatever that looks like for you, you've got to build systems in place that someone can pick up, whether it's you or not. So someone can pick up my partner management campaign and they get a task and they go, this is the process I need to follow. Right? It'll tell me when I need to do something. Absolutely. That's what, that's the difference between the, you know, that's a real business. I think that's a real business. That's a business that's going to grow and scale and leverage and provide you the lifestyle that you want. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, as I alluded to earlier on, a business is an en enterprise that is profitable, that actually functions and runs um, without you, all right? So a lot of us have just gotten ourselves a glorified job. And if you're confused about all this marketing options and automation, I advise you get a hold of team. I'm going to be putting all his information right at the bottom there so that you too um, can get a hold of him and... Um, simplify or just have somebody who can take it, uh, take good care of it. Um, you know, cause we can't all be proficient in one aspect, uh, of the business. And as we have said, and as you can, uh, gather Tim and his team, they actually help small business, uh, owners like yourself to actually win more business, uh, more often and make more money with less struggle. Tim, I can't thank you enough for the time, your expertise, and the value that you've given us on the show today. Is it because your business is all automated and you probably made a million dollars while you're speaking to us? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, Prosper, thank you. It's been an absolute joy being on the program today and, and uh, chatting to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, my man.